uh, number five. And what I want you to do on this is, um, so here's what it looks like. It's sort of, there's a lot going on. Um, so there's a beam like that. And a pin joint there, and a pin joint at the midpoint. And all of these joints are pin joints. And let's say that this distance is 0.5 meters. This distance is 1 meter. These angles are both 20 degrees. Um, and then there is a distributed load here. Uh, where this has a magnet, uh, um, maximum of 1,500 newtons per meter. Okay, so first... Um, Let's do this with the numbering uh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. And um, first, I want you to just go through and do the free body diagrams for each one of those members. We're not going to do any calculations right now. So, with this numbering, Draw a free body diagram for each member. Okay, we're ignoring the weights of the individual members. Um, okay, so go ahead and uh, work together. Ask me questions if you get stuck. Uh, compare your answers to each other, and then I'll go up and talk through it. And then we'll renumber it and go through the same thing again. Just um, because really, you know, I think a lot of people think of this as a part that, like, this might be the part that people gloss over the most. But this is really the key to getting these problems right more than anything else. The rest of this stuff is all stuff you've already done. So, so um, you don't have to do this on every problem, but sometimes if you get confused and, you know, the joints where you have more than two members at them are usually the, the trickiest ones. Um, drawing a side view of what's happening can be a really helpful thing. So let me just draw like what's happening at the side views of each one of these joints before I start the free body diagrams. Um, so at the joint A, um, we have the member one going away from us and member two up and then the pin going through them both and uh, we're going to lump the pin in with member one and so you know uh Anything that's happening to the pin, if there are external forces applied or anything like that, they're applied to member one. And then member two touches member one because it touches the pin. Uh, B and C are the two complicated ones. So at B, we have member two 
And then we have member three going away diagonally. I'm thinking of uh, looking at it from over here. Um, and then member five is just going away from us. So here's member three, here's member five. There's a pin going through all of them. The lowest numbered member at this joint is two. So I'm going to assume that that pin is part of member two. Whoops, that's not it. So Okay, so at member two, uh, what we have is three and five are both in contact with two, but three is only in contact with two, so there's no force on three by five. And same when you isolate five, there's no force on five by three. You know, five and three are just touching those pins. So you'll see that when we go to those free body diagrams. And then C from the side, uh, that's the one I did over there. Um, I guess when I drew it up there, I was sort of thinking of looking at it from the other side, so they're going to be flipped around backwards. But uh, so C, um, number one, is going away from us. Uh, number three is coming diagonally towards us. Member four is going diagonally away from us. There's a pin going through all of them. This is three and four. And you see the same story again. Um, on the lowest numbered member at the joint, there's a force from each other member of that joint. But the ones that aren't the lowest numbered members don't touch each other. Okay, so when you isolate one at C, you have a force on one by three and a force on one by four. But when you isolate three, you only have a force on three by one. You don't have a force on three by five. Any questions about that? And then uh, D is easy. So. All right, so first free body diagram of one. There's a fixed joint with the wall, so that's an unknown force vector and a couple. And then at the middle, there's a pin joint connecting one to two, so this is the force on one by two. And then at the joint uh, C, you have the force on one by three, and the force on one by four. Now, member two, so that's this short one. Um, down at joint A, oh, I guess I'm calling that A, so this I'll just, I'll just leave this as R. That's the only reaction force with the outside. So, um, so member two, at A, we have contact with member one. So this is the force on two by one, or negative force on one by two. And then up at the joint B, if you look at this side view, um, there's contact with two from three and from five. So there's a F two three, and an F25.
And then member three. Up at the joint B, member three is in contact with member two, but it's not in contact with member five. So up here, there's a force on three by two, and I'll write that as negative F23. And then down at the joint C, three is in contact with one but it's not in contact with four. So we just have uh, the force on three by one, which is negative F13. And then remember four. Um, at the joint C, if you look at the side view, 4 is in contact with 1, but it's not in contact with 3. So we have a force on 4 by 1. And I'll write that as negative force on 1 by 4. And then um, up at the joint B, we only have two bodies in contact here. Uh, there's no external forces applied at that pin. So um, this is just going to be the force on 4 by 5. And what about that distributed load? Uh, so it looks like that distributed load is, you know, part of that distributed load is applied at that pin. So why doesn't that show up there? You know, if that is a force applied to that pin, then we're assuming that that pin is part of member four. So, yeah. That is a good way to think of it, actually. And that's not what I was going to say, but yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Um, I was just going to say, remember that these distributed loads are not point forces. You know, they, um, so you need some finite, uh, you need that distributed load applied over some finite distance in order to get a finite force. This is, there's only one infinitesimal, you know, amount of that distributed load applied at that pin, and so that doesn't produce any finite force, okay? So the distributed load itself is applied over member five, and so that's where it's going to appear. Okay, and then the last one, um, free body diagram of member five. Um, so at the joint D, we have the force on five by four. At the joint B, we only have the force on five by two, because three and five don't touch each other. Yep. What? What places are you thinking of? Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, so this way of drawing it, okay, so on the left end, we have the force on five by four, negative F. Four five. Um, at the joint B, we have the force on five by two, or negative F two five. And then we have the distributed load. Um, that's going to act a third of the way from the wall side to the point side. Um, and the total magnitude is uh, the whole length is one meter. You can figure that out from the geometry. Um, 
And so we have a base of one meter times the height of 1,500 divided by two, so 750. And that's it. Okay, so this might seem like overkill, but let's do this one more time. We're going to renumber everything, and you'll see that those free body diagrams all look different. Um, but if you actually went through the whole calculation with these two approaches, with these renumberings, in the end, if you calculated the external loads on every body, you, you'd get the same answers. Okay, so it's arbitrary, but once you choose a system, you have to, you have to be consistent in that system. Okay, so let me move this. Okay, so do it again, but with a new numbering. Okay, so this time I'll number from this side. Uh, so this is member one, two, three, four, five. Yes. Uh, it's pretty likely that I would ask a question like this because um, in a 80 minute test, we don't have time to go through like full structures problems unless they're the simplest type, you know? So I do ask, I do ask questions like this pretty often on tests. So I'm going to start out with drawing the side views of these joints again. Um, I guess, you know, A and D are pretty simple, so I'm just going to do it for B and C. So at the joint B, a side view. Um, now we have the member five over there. Uh, we have three going away diagonally and two going away horizontally. And then that's the pin going through everything. And we're going to assume that the or, you know, we're not really assuming that the pin is part of member two. It doesn't have to be. We're just lumping those two together as a single isolated body. Um, so two touches three and five, but five and three don't touch. And then at the joint C, uh, we have member four going away horizontally. Member three coming towards us diagonally. Member one going away diagonally. And then the pin. And we're lumping the pin in with member one. So one touches three and four, and three and four don't touch each other. And it's it works out the same every time. It's the lowest numbered member at that joint touches everything. The ones that aren't the lowest numbered only touch the lowest number. That's just how it works out every time. Okay, so member one. Um, that touches member two up at the top. So there's the force on one by two. 
And at C, it touches three and four. So here's a force on one by three and a force on one by four. And then number two is the one with the distributed load. Um, so we have the downward force of 750 from the distributed load, a third of the way from the left to the right. Then over here we have the force on two by one, so that's negative F12. And then at B, two is the lowest numbered member, so it touches three and five. So here we have the force on two by three and the force on two by five. And then member three, Down at the bottom, at joint C, three only touches one. It doesn't touch four. So we have the force on three by one, or negative F13. And up at B, um, it only touches two. It doesn't touch five. So we have the force on three by two or negative F23. And uh, then uh, member four. The wall's a fixed joint, uh, so this is a reaction force and a couple. And then at A, uh, it's in contact with member five. So that's a force on four by five. And then at C, four touches one, but it doesn't touch three. So this is the force on four by one, or negative F14. And then the last one is five. Um, at A, it's touching four, so. That's negative F45. And then the top is joint B. Five is touching two, but it's not touching three. So that's the force on five by two, or negative F25. Um, And the kind of amazing thing about this, if you, I mean, I know it takes a lot of time to do this, so, you know, it may, like, it wouldn't surprise me if you don't find the time to do this. But if, so, it's not just that the numbers change, right? I mean, there, you look at the same member in one of these numberings, and it has totally different number of forces acting on it than with the other numbering. Like, look at this horizontal member here. It has, uh, it has three of these contact force vectors on it, whereas up here it only had two. So it's not just that you're relabeling things. But if you actually go through the problem both ways and then add up all the forces that are acting on a member at a single point and come up with a final representation of all the external loads acting on each member, um, you get the exact same thing, which is and it's, it's sort of hard to imagine how it works out, but it works out. 
Any questions about that one?